We are in our series, In My Feeling. So we've been going through the last few weeks. Listen up, listen up. And so I'm really excited to be talking to you guys today. And if you remember what we've been talking about, part of this series is really thinking through how do we have healthy emotions? How, do we, how does being a follower of Jesus even impact how we experience our emotions and what we do with them, right? And so hopefully you've gotten a, a little bit out of the last few weeks wrestling with that. Uh, but one of the things that was said, I think, a few weeks ago is this, that your feelings are always real, but they aren't always true. Your feelings are real, but they aren't always true. And what I mean by that is that, hey, your feelings are real. People can't say, hey, like blow them off, pretend like they don't exist, but your feelings matter. Your feelings are actually a gift from God. God has feelings. And so part of the way you are made in the image of God, you reflect him, is having feelings. So feelings aren't a bad thing. But what you also need to remember is that your feelings aren't always true. So if you live your life with your feelings as your compass, determining what you do and how you act, it's going to lead you astray sometimes. And so based on that, we kind of started off with uh, two questions for you a couple weeks ago. And I just want to repeat them here because I think it's helpful for us. But they're this. Do you, uh, you control your emotions or do your emotions control you? It's part of what you need to evaluate, even think through this whole series. Are my emotions controlling me or am I controlling them? And what plays into that is the second question. Are your emotions filtered through what you know to be true about Jesus? And it's just a simple reality. If you're a fall of Jesus, God says that impacts all of your life, including how you deal with your emotions. So are you, are you living in such a way that what Jesus has done for you impacts what you do with your feelings? All right, so that, those are two important questions. And what we're going to do tonight is we're going to talk about the emotion anger, which is a big one, right? Like you've probably experienced anger today. I saw some of you getting angry playing volleyball earlier. It was crazy, right? So, I mean, it's competitive. So anger's real, but we got to figure out what do we do with it? And I want you to think about the last time you were angry. Was it godly anger? Was it sinful anger? Really, how do you even know if it was one or the other? And then once you got angry, how did you respond? Did you respond in a way that glorified God or didn't glorify God? And what I want you to do tonight is think about yourself as a pinata, all right? Think about yourself as a pinata. And what I mean by that is this, that when you get beat up by life, it's kind of like you're a pinata and stuff falls out, right? And so the question is, is it going to be good stuff like candy, like in a pinata? That's what you want to come out. Or is it going to be garbage, right? Is it bad stuff that's pouring out of you? So when you get angry, when life beats you up, it, I want you to picture yourself like a pinata. What is coming out? What am I producing? Um, and, and, that's, and that's really what we're, we're going to talk about today when we think about anger. So three truths tonight that I want to talk to you about. The first is this. Not all anger is sinful. So not all anger is sinful. And it comes from Mark 11, verses 15 through 19. So let me read this for us. It's about Jesus. And, and they came to Jerusalem, and he entered the temple and began to drive out those who sold and those who bought in the temple. And he overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold pigeons. And he would not allow anyone to carry anything through the temple. And he was teaching them and saying to them, Is it not written, My house shall be called a house of prayer for all nations? But you have made it a den of robbers. And the chief priests and the scribes heard it and were seeking a way to destroy him. For they feared him because all the crowd was astonished at his teaching. And when evening, evening had came, they went out of the city. And so this is important because Jesus was angry in this passage. And it's not the only time he's angry in scripture. In Mark 3, 5, it says he's angry with the Pharisees. But what we see in this passage, Jesus goes to Jerusalem, to the temple to worship, and he gets mad about what's happening in the temple. And he's flipping over tables. He's kicking the merchants out. Like, I want you guys to picture money flying everywhere. There's pigeons flying around. It's crazy. Uh, the Gospel of Luke tells this story as well. And it describes Jesus with a leather whip, swinging it at people, getting them out of the way, right? That's anger. And so what we know about uh, Jesus what is throughout all of Scripture is that he isn't, uh, he's not sinful. He's sinless, that Jesus never had sinned. And because of that, we know that Jesus, even in his anger here, didn't sin. So what, what's helpful for us in that is it means not all anger is sinful. And what that means for you is not all of your anger is sinful either. 
that we can, just like Jesus here, have a godly anger, right? The, the whole Bible, especially as you get in the Old Testament, describes God as experiencing anger sometimes. So anger itself isn't sinful. And if you look at Ephesians 4, verse 26, it says something very similar. It says, be angry and do not sin. And so there seems to be this expectation in the Bible that you will experience emotions, you'll experience anger, but what God cares about is not that you've experienced it in the first place, but what you do with it. So when you experience anger, when you have that emotion, do not sin, right? So even I want you to think back to that, uh, that pinata illustration. Like if you're a pinata, what God cares about is not, not that you don't ever get angry, right? You're going to get beat up by life. Things aren't going to go the way you want. You're going to get frustrated sometimes. But when you get beat up, what's coming out of you? Are you responding in sin? Garbage is coming out of the pinata? Or is it good stuff coming out in response? And so I want you to, again, think about the last time you were angry. Was it, was it sinful? Was it wrong? Think about a time when you were betrayed, lied about, people talked negatively about you, made up a rumor about you. How, how did you handle that? Was it sinful? And what came out? Was it a good response? Was it garbage? Or was it something that people actually enjoy like candy? Was it a good God glorifying response? And so that's kind of what we're going to talk about in these last two truths this evening is how do we even know when our anger is sinful or not? Right? We know that not all anger is sinful, but how do we know if it's sinful or not? So this first truth is this. Anger is sinful when it's me-centered and not tied to sin. And so I want to be careful here. When I say me-centered, it doesn't mean that like when you're angry because somebody was mean to you or sinned against you. Like if it has to do with you, it doesn't mean it's sinful in general. When I say me-centered, I mean selfishness, right? When, When we experience anger, a lot of times what it's tied to is just us being minorly inconvenienced, right? We're late, we want to do something and we aren't allowed. Like you have plans for your Saturday morning. Uh, you're going to hang out with your friends and your parents forgot to tell you, you got to go to your great aunt Gertrude's house and you really don't want to and it sounds awful, right? And you get mad, right? It's inconvenient. Your, your plans are messed up. You, you want to play, you know, video games or do whatever you want and your parents won't let you and you get mad, right? But in those situations, I, I get like that too, right? Like when I'm late or... Um, my big thing is just like even the idolatry of comfort. I just want to sit and watch the Browns play or a movie, eat a good snack. And when those things get messed up, I lose my temper. I get angry. And, and so I want that to be a good filter for you guys. When it's, it's not about sin, like no one's sinned against me. No one's wronged me. I'm just minorly inconvenienced. It's a good chance for you to take a step back and be like, hey, I don't think this is godly anger. I can repent of this. I don't need to be mean to somebody right now. I, I, can, I can not be angry right now. But what God does care about, again, is how we respond in our anger. So whether it's a godly anger or a sinful anger, what God does care about is how we respond in that. And so what Matthew 5.22 says is, I think, really helpful in understanding this. It says this, this is Jesus speaking, but I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother is liable to judgment. Whoever insults his brother will be liable to counsel. And whoever says you fool will be li- liable to the hell of fire. And, and what Jesus is saying here, there's, there's more to that passage, but he was really talking about, is he's saying, hey, you think you know, murder is awful, but if, you're, if you hate your brother, you want negative things for him, you're insulting him, you're calling him names, It's just like you're murdering them in your heart. And so part of what Jesus is getting at here is, hey, we need to, even in our anger, right? Not all anger is sinful. You might have a reason to be angry, but even in our anger, are we treating people like they're made in the image of God? Are we treating people like like, uh, God thinks of them, that they have value and worth? Are we blowing up, trying to hurt their feelings, saying things that aren't true about them? And just even flipping back to Ephesians 4, This really ties to uh, Matthew really well, but it says this in uh, verse 31 and 32. It says, let all bitterness, wrath, and anger, clamor, slander be put away from you, along with all malice. Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another as God 
in Christ has forgiven you. So do you see this tension, right? It says, put away bitterness, put away malice. We've all experienced maybe anger like that where we, we dwell on it, we're mad at somebody, we get bitter, we want bad things to happen to people. And Jesus is saying, God's saying, don't do that. Don't do that. You don't need to sit in that anymore. That's not what God wants for you, whether they, they deserve it or not. Instead, do something else. And he describes, be kind, be tender-hearted. So not hard-hearted, not wanting them bad to happen to them, but being soft-hearted, gracious to them and forgiving others like Christ has forgiven you. And so, again, I want you to think about that really good illustration Johnny did two weeks ago with the coffee filter. We need to filter our emotions through what we know to be true about Jesus. And that's, that's really what Ephesians 4 is saying here. You need to forgive others like Christ has forgiven you. The only way you can forgive people when they've sinned against you, you're angry with them, is if you remember what Jesus has done for you. And so... This is a hard thing to say, but it's true. I think it's important for you. You need to hear this. At one point, God was angry with you, right? Like in the way that you've been angry with somebody when they've sinned against you, right? Angry. But the only reason that gets gets fixed is because Jesus stepped in for you and took the anger of God on your behalf. And so that when God looks at you, when you put your faith in Jesus, he's, he's not angry anymore. He's forgiven you. Your relationship is restored, And so we need to sometimes take a step back and say, man, that person that I'm mad at who's wronged me isn't the worst person in the world. You know, in some ways, that's me, that I'm the worst person. And God's forgiven me of so much. And because he's done that, I can forgive others of a ton of stuff as well, right? Because of what Jesus has done, I've got to filter my anger through that so that I don't handle my anger in a sinful way, but in a God-glorifying way. And then lastly, our last point is just really the reverse of this. Anger isn't sinful when it's towards sin and injustice and with the intent to love God and love others. Your chief purpose, your existence is to love God and to love others well, to do what God's called us to do. And so if you're wondering what does it look like uh, to be angry in a way that's like Jesus, it's to be angry about sin and evil and to, to handle your anger in a way that loves God and love, uh, loves others. So what I think would be most helpful is just looking at that Mark 11 passage that we started with of Jesus being angry. And I just want us to like kind of walk through why Jesus is angry and what we can learn from him here. So let me read it for us again real quick. It says, They came to Jerusalem, and he entered the temple and began to drive out all those who sold and began to drive out or, and, and those who bought in the temple. And he overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold pigeons. And he would not allow anyone to carry anything through the temple. And he was teaching them and saying to them, Is it not written, My house shall be called a house of prayer for all nations? And the chief priests, um, but you have made it a den of robbers. And the chief priests and the scribes heard it and were seeking a way to destroy him, for they feared him because all the crowd was astonished at his teaching. And when evening came, they went out of the city. So Jesus experienced anger here, and he experienced it for three reasons. And if you look at this passage, verse 17, he says, my, my house uh, shall be called a, pra- a house of prayer for all nations. And what you need to know about the temple that he walked into, they're in the outer court. It's also called the Gentile court. So the purpose of that outer court was for the nations, those who weren't Israelites, to worship God. It is the closest they could get in the temple to the presence of God in Israel and worship. But what was going on was there was money changers yelling, there's people, merchants buying and selling, there's pigeons all over the place, right? So picture that going on here and you at the same time trying to listen to me, right? It's not going to happen. Right, if a pigeon flew across right now, you guys would be super distracted. <laughs> yeah, just you, okay. Um, and that's what the Gentiles were experiencing. So part of why Jesus is angry is because people are being prevented from worshiping him. Right? That's the evil, that's the sin that's going on. But he continues on, and he says, uh, but you have made it a den of robbers. And part of the reason why Jesus can call somebody robbers 
and it not be sinful is because it's true, right? So we're, we're, we're assuming something here. He doesn't go into it. But part of what they're doing that's wrong is the merchants that are selling there are taking advantage of people. They're overcharging them. He's angry about sin. And the third thing, he's trying to get them to understand the temple isn't the solution, but that Jesus is a better way, that he is the temple, that he is going to make a way for them to be uh, saved and forgiven. So Jesus is angry, but it's righteous anger. It's righteous anger. It's good anger. That you can, part of what good anger is, is anger that's, uh, that's towards sin and injustice. And honestly, guys, I think this is something we're not good at a lot. Like, we are, at times, I think, are too apathetic to what God cares about and the things that he is angry about. But we should be angry about abuse. We should be angry about bad things that are happening to people, things that are happening in conflicts and wars all over the world. We should be angry about those things because in part, God's angry about those things. So let me give you an example from my life. Uh, I went to a Bible school, which is a weird thing to do for college, but that's what I did. And uh, one of the guys I graduated with uh, his whole life right now is set up towards trying to get people not to believe in Jesus. That's, that's all he does. He tells people that Jesus isn't God, that he was just a dude that was teaching decent stuff, but Jesus was sinful, that he was racist, that he, he wasn't a savior. And actually what he'd say is he said, hey, actually you guys don't need a savior. You're good enough on your own. Hey, you know, Whatever the Bible says about things you shouldn't do that you want to do, don't listen to it. It's just restrictive. It's not for you. And that's what he tells people. And guys, I don't know how else to explain it. It makes me furious. It makes me so angry because I know what he's doing, and he's leading people away from Jesus. He's leading people to hell, and he's putting them in this slavery that's harming their lives and their families and will harm them for, for who knows how long as long as they listen to him. And it makes me angry. And part of it, guys, it should. Because I think it makes God angry. It's not a good thing. It's evil. It's injustice. And when we are angry about sin sometimes, sometimes we don't provide justice and deal with sin appropriately. And so it's a good thing. But at the same time, part of what I need to check my heart in is I need to make sure I'm not doing the opposite of Matthew 5 where I'm not murdering him in my heart, when I'm just not like, man, I hate this guy. Instead of hating his sin, hating what he's doing, um, and, and balancing that truth. And what helps me, uh, one of my favorite passages of all scripture is Romans 12. And so when I get frustrated, when, I have been, uh, when I've been sinned against big time, and I'm angry about it, this passage helps me. It says this in Romans 12, 18 through 21. If possible, as far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. To the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him something to drink. For, so, uh, for by doing so, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not overcome, be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. And it's just this reminder of, first, what God's called me to is to live peaceably with all people as far as it depends on me, right? So how do I, because of this filter, filtering my emotions through Jesus, am I gracious? Am I able to forgive quickly? Do I turn the other cheek like Jesus has called me to? Am I living peaceably? And that doesn't mean uh, being walked over. That doesn't mean not ever having conflict, but it means dealing with sin appropriately and, and seeking restored relationships, but he also goes on and he says, vengeance is mine. And what's really helpful about this, and, and you guys have probably lived long enough where you've gotten to a point maybe where you've experienced it where reconciliation cannot happen, where evil has happened and justice is not done. And how do I come to terms with that? How do I deal with my anger? And what Jesus says is, hey, you might not experience full justice right now, but I will I, I will handle justice and vengeance for the wrongdoing that you've seen and experienced, whether it happens now or happens later, I will enact justice. And so what that does for us is it takes the weight off our shoulders to feel like we have to bear that anger and that sin. It doesn't mean we don't seek justice. It doesn't mean we don't try to deal with that stuff, but it takes the pressure off of us. And so instead of trying to get even or to get back, 
We don't have to overcome evil with more evil. When people are mean to us, we don't need to be mean back. Right? When somebody makes up a lie or rumor about us, we don't need to do it back. But we can overcome evil with good. Because God has done that for us. That even when we did evil, he overcome, overcame us with good, died for us, and saved us. All right, there's a lot there. I know I read a lot of passages for you, so let me just close in this. Just hopefully this is helpful application. How are we supposed to handle anger? That's the loudest Taco Bell rapper ever. <laughs> How do we handle anger? First, I want you guys to ask yourself this. Is it about me or is it about God? Right, is it about me and my selfishness? Is it about my inconvenience or is it about sin, God being glorified, people being harmed? What am I actually angry about? And if it's just a minor inconvenience, if it's just about my discomfort, like being uncomfortable, or my plan didn't go the way I want, man, let's be quick to, to turn from our anger and repent and, and handle it appropriately. And, and when we can, turn the other cheek, be gracious to one another, but deal with sin. Second here, hate situations and sin, not people, right? We don't want to murder people in our hearts. We want to treat people like they're valuable, like they're made in the image of God, but we, we can hate sin, hate evil that's going on. But we need to be careful not to mix up the two. Third here, just practically, you can take time away and just say, hey, hold on, I need to calm down. Pray, ask God to help you with your anger. Like emotions are hard because we can't control what we feel sometimes. So even just like you can talk to God and be like, man, I'm mad right now and I know I shouldn't be. Like I know my anger is sinful right now and work through it with the Lord. And then I want you guys to remember Romans 12 because it helps me. Remember that part of what Jesus has called you to, if you're a follower of him, is to live peaceably with people as far as it depends on you. To be gracious, to be loving. Doesn't mean you get stepped on and walked all over and you don't ever deal with sin, but it does mean you're, you're quick to be forgiving, gracious, uh, and, and seek reconciliation. But we also know that can't always happen. And so I want to encourage you, when justice is not done, when evil happens and it feels like no, no accountability is going to happen, uh, God will avenge. God will hold people accountable for the wrong they do. And that's why we need to tell them about Jesus, because Jesus is our only hope for forgiveness for those things that we do. And lastly, filter your anger through the gospel and what you know to be true about Jesus. Right? That, that is it. I know, uh, as an adult pastor, I cannot handle my anger well if my eyes are not focused on Jesus. Like, I will blow up just like the next person. I will not handle my anger well. So am I remembering that Jesus has died for me? That I'm not better than other people? That Jesus has, man, he has saved me from so much, and so I can be gracious like Jesus has been gracious with me? Or am I forgetting what Jesus has done with, for me? Again, three truths today. Not all anger is sinful. Anger is sinful when it's me-centered and not tied to sin. And lastly, anger isn't sinful when it's towards sin and injustice and with the intent to love others and love God, right? What's happening when your pinata is hit, right? Is trash coming out? Is garbage coming out? Your sinfulness? Or are we focusing on Jesus and loving people well and good stuff coming out? Let me pray for us. Father God, thank you so much for tonight. I pray that you are glorified, that your word would, uh, that you'd speak to us through your word, that you'd convict us of sin. Um, but Lord, that you'd also help us handle complicated emotions, uh, that we, we always can't control what we feel, but Lord, help us to uh, even stop to think through, am I doing, am I handling this in a way that honors you? Am I reflecting you well? Am I, am I using my emotions to glorify you? And I know that you will help us through your spirit, Lord. So I pray that you do that and bless our conversations. In Jesus' name, amen.